Thank you for joining me this for the first Adirondack Experience and Adirondack Diversity Initiative discussion on the Black experience in the Adirondacks. I'm Clifford Oliver, your host for this evening. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, Amy Godin, I should probably introduce myself first. Um, for 16 years, I was the agency photographer with New York State's Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Um, and though not a student of history, I found, I found myself surrounded by workmates who were passionate about history and the stories history told. Um, that passion was infectious, and I learned of black history that was never mentioned in my schools uh, from some of the most renowned scholars in the nation. I have researched the lives of John Henry of Whitehall and Len Hazard of Greenwich, my home. Uh, John Henry was a Civil War contraband who followed soldiers north to Whitehall where he uh, started a, a successful smithy. Len Hazard of Greenwich was a common laborer who found adventure in France during World War I as a member of the Harlem Hellfighters. I have delved into the lives and careers, and biographies of a handful of 19th century black Adirondackers who should be better known. And all this digging has furnished me with material for lectures, exhibits, and reenactments. Every February, Adirondack Life magazine had a story or has stories on blacks in the DAX. And every story had the same author, Amy Godin. I could not wait to meet this person. 20 years ago, I was on the research team for Dreaming of Timbuktu, led by my hero, Amy Godin. Independent scholar Amy Godin has been delving into Adirondack social history for 30 years. Her articles in Adirondack Life have explored vigilante culture, labor uprisings, poor houses, the stories of Chinese, Spanish, Jewish immigrants, and uh, migratory labor. Um, Black Adirondack history and racist influences in the early conservation movement. She is the writer curator of Dreaming of Timbuktu, an exhibition on view at John Brown Farm, uh, historic site in North Alba, um, about a Black Adirondack farm settlement before the Civil War. Tonight's program is going to be a little different than the interviews and panel discussions that have already taken place in this series. Amy has turned up some amazing photographs that she is going to share with us in a PowerPoint presentation. I always ask Amy, where do you come up with this stuff? Tonight, she is going to tell us. Some housekeeping for our audience this evening. If you would like to submit a question during this program, please submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You will only be able to see your own questions. For questions that are not addressed this evening, ADI will, um, will add more information to its website along with a link to a recording of this evening's discussion. If you are having any trouble during this live stream, feel free to post a question to Q&A and a staff person will provide guidance. Amy's amazing presentation will last about 30 minutes, at which point we will open things up to questions. I am sure there are going to be questions. Thank you. Am I on? Can you, everyone see me? All is good? Yes. Thanks, Cliff, for your lovely words and your overpraise as usual. And thanks to all of you for uh, zooming in on a beautiful summer night and to some other folks as well, to David Kahn of the Adirondack <laughs> Experience for deeming this a worthy subject for a talk. Folklorist Susan Hurley Glawa, whose 2004 study of blackface in Colton, an Adirondack hamlet, first got me wondering just how widespread and enduring Adirondack blackface has been. Adirondack Life, which will publish a version of this talk this winter, and thanks too to the Adirondack History Museum, the Experience, Tupper Lake Library, the Lake Placid, North Elba Historical Society and Mark Frieden for the use of many of the images you'll see tonight. Thank you. I'm not going to comment much on the images. I'll let them comment on what I'm saying as I talk. Expect about 25 minutes of me and then Cliff will moderate a Q&A. 
some of these images are pretty disturbing. And this talk of necessity includes offensive language. So please, if you think you'll be upset by this, give this talk a pass. And note too, before we start, this is not a study of present day blackface incidents in the region. I'm not going to talk about all the politicians who messed with blackface in their college years of the 2015 blackface cover of a SUNY Plattsburgh uh, college publication or the inane blackface antics of some SUNY Potsdam co-eds a few years back. Incidents that roused a storm of hurt, fury, apologies, and ink. Blackface in our time is a very rich topic, but tonight I'm not pulling out those weeds I'm digging in the seed bed that nourished them. That would be the very long period when Adirondack blackface was the opposite of outrageous, when it was everywhere, not just in the bigger cities in the region, but in towns as small as Port Henry, Faust, Freda, Clintonville, and Long Lake. And when everybody did it, school kids and women's clubs, fraternal orders, firemen, and not as college students do it now for the thrill of violating a taboo, but for comfort, for community, for love of a homegrown tradition whose essential racism went unheeded and unchallenged. First, a quick trip to New York City to the scene of the crime, the original theft or appropriation that launched a thousand blackface reviews. Sometime in the 1820s, a white actor in Manhattan, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, met a black man, a stable hand, who also happened to be a terrific dancer. This performer, never named, was disabled, but the moves he made, which were lurchy, yet elastic, syncopated, spry, turned his disability into an asset. He sang, too, wheel about and turn just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. With an eye and an ear for something fresh, Thomas Rice memorized the black man's dance and song and took it to the stage. How big a deal was this? In two de decades, Jim Crow dance, song, and style had emerged as the leading form of public performance in the nation. Louisville, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, and New Orleans each declared itself its birthplace by 1844, the Ethiopian serenaders, a blackface troupe, were performing for President Tyler in the White House. Pop critic Rail Marcus had called, has called Thomas Dartmouth Rice the Elvis of his age, a polymath who wrote and acted all his routines and cooked up characters, both relatable and nuanced. Yeah. Rice's mimetic and dramatic gifts did not distinguish his successors. As early as the late 1840s, minstrel routines began to stale. Black characters grew, grew less rounded, comic but now stereotyped and ready-made to mock. Formula drove the skits, and the tired routines were culled from newspapers. Minstrelsy, its sheet music, costumes, makeup, and hand-me-down palaver were commodified. This went for black minstrel shows and white alike, both well-steeped in their routines when they finally ventured from the fringes of the Adirondacks to the harder to reach interior, riding in on new rail spurs, setting up in village opera houses and town halls. To learn more about black minstrelsy inside the blue line, which, town, which towns welcomed it and how it raised funds for black institutions in the South, colleges, farm schools, churches, I refer you to Blacks in the Adirondacks by Sally Spenson which gives this slice of cultural history several well-packed pages. White minstrelsy is my subject here because it was more dominant. It reached the region earlier as a side act that piggybacked on earlier traveling circuses, as you see here. Its venues were more numerous and its staying power more robust. Indeed, for most Adirondackers, drawn to minstrel shows, blackface was the work and cultural prerogative of whites. Why the long appeal? After the rupture and devastation of the Civil War, Blackface's cheerful skits about African Americans were for, white, were for white America a solace and relief. In the South and North alike, Black Americans were pressing for equal opportunity and equal rights. Emancipation was one thing, but social and political equality was for most of white America too much, too fast, 
too far. The blackface stage where childlike impulsive black people gratefully embraced their place was more than funny. <coughs> it rationalized white supremacism and it consoled. It gave the two devastated white halves of the nation a little common ground, something that could ease their reconciliation. It gave them a vision written rags and burnt cork of black inferiority. And the more hungrily black America pressed for political representation, social parity and voting rights, the more the counter narrative of black servility delighted. A narrative I need to stress reinforced in post bellum Adirondack newspapers for decades. <coughs> in travel dispatches from New Yorkers in the South depicting freed slaves as helpless, lazy, languishing, in syndicated melodramas in the papers describing freed people's keen, enduring nostalgia for old Mars and the lost comforts of plantation life, in confident editorials asserting the indifferent performance of black soldiers in the war, even in commercial ads like this one advertising Saranac deerskin gloves in 1878 with the baronial Adirondack W.H.H. Murray gazing coolly over his domain <coughs> while his undersized assistant placed on a par with Murray's dogs kneels over a pile of potatoes at the side. All these white made takes on the black experience aim to demean, all of them aim to, to, to put black people in their place. How did blackface manage to achieve this in the Adirondack region the same way it did in St. Louis, Brooklyn, Asheville. First, the mask of blackface effaced the human individual and reduced character to type. Burnt cork and shoe polish, red paint and white, smeared human faces into a mask, and the sameness of the paint color reduced African-American skin tones to one dead color. Kinky wigs suggested wild, helpless, wildness, helpless wildness and the lack of personal control. Costumes either foppish for the character Zip Coon, ragged for the rustic goofball Jim Crow, or just folksy country spoke of pathetic vanity or an uncomplaining poverty. And of course, there was the minstrel's exaggeratedly rough speech ranging from ungrammatical to outright nonsensical. <coughs> Maybe more than dance or gesture, speech was what racialized the blackface character investing him with a helpless immaturity that justified, indeed demanded, white oversight. Give him fancy words, he'd mangle them to mud. The only help for it was to love him for what he was, a child man in everlasting need of a father's patience, firmness, and direction. On stage, that parent figure was the interlocutor, the always white, unflappable straight man who fed his you can see him right there in the middle of your um, screen. He's the only white man in the um, stage and you'll see one in every one of these stage pictures we have. He was the straight man who fed his end men, his sambos and his bones, teasing questions that provoked the eager jokes and hokum, which evidenced the lesser status of black Americans then now forever. Anyway, this was the idea. But scripts are made to be subverted and as blackface scholars observe, while blackface was inarguably racist, it was more and this more mattered. While the style and form of blackface banner was predictable, the content was adaptive. It had to be to satisfy audiences looking for something fresh. Troops both hometown and from away made a point of wrapping local names and goings on and even controversies into their shtick. A tradition that made the audience experience interactive something straight up opera, never did, never could. That was one kind of subversion. <clears throat> Here was another, since blackface characters stood for an underclass, their routines were often seasoned with sly digs at town guardians of respectability, like bankers, churchmen, merchants, politicians. And through these takedowns on the safe space, safe space of the stage, blackface democratized, a feature that accounted for a good piece of its popularity. Not yet. This clip promotes a, gum, a coming blackface church benefit in Glens Falls with the promise of participation from the high school principal. A big thrill for these Presbyterians. In 1926, 
This was Saturday Night Live, Ed Sullivan, and Soul Train, all in one. Blackface had its body sexualized side too, but how much this aspect infiltrated Adirondack music halls and opera houses is hard to know when the scripts themselves have vanished. Some smuttiness was enough of a concern to the culturally conservative Adirondacks, however, to move several blackface promoters to solemnly declare that their shows were free of all salacious content. Indeed, some ads could make you think that blackface's mission was strictly reverential, guarding and preserving the true minstrel tradition. Quote, minstrels capable of impersonating the genuine Negro brought throngs to Johnstown in 1891, offering an introduction to, quote, the tints, lights, and shadows of darky life in a genuine Negro dialect. In 1900, Gloversville audiences were treated to an act that promised, quote, the one, only true exponent of blackface comedy, the solemn emphasis on craft and culture helped allay any worry about blackface's unrespectability. Here was fun, sure, but also folk life, history, a taste of the lost South, a jolly land of music, dance, and sweet devotion to God and Massa. This was how 300 years of chattel slavery shimmered in the funhouse glass of blackface. The distortion was more striking when black minstrel troops, mostly Southern, also raised the funhouse mirror and assured their audiences that yes, old black Joe and decamp town races got it right. This was how it was. The, Pla the Plattsburgh audiences in 1866 really would hear from the Georgia minstrels, quote, entertainments illustrative of Negro plantation life in the Southern states. The, the, quote, old plantation songs delivered by Gorman's Alabama troubadours in those mellow musical tones that only Southern people possess really could convey the experience of genuine coons to Gloversville in 1903. That when black bellboys and waiters from Lake George's Fort William Henry put on a cakewalk and a watermelon eating contest in Warrensburg in 1901, they really would invoke the sunny South and cotton fields of their past. But this was not their past. This was a market-driven narrative of the industrial, peaceably racialized America, which suggests that when black minstrels served up the same cozy scenes of servility as whites, they too donned a kind of black blackface, if sometimes without the grease paint or burned cord. But more generations of Adirondackers knew minstrelsy as a white thing. It's what they were accustomed to, what they come to expect. All coons look alike to me, read an ad for the patriotic minstrel troupe in Lake Placid in 1908, but the drophead reassured, these are different. Why? <clears throat> because these performers were not coons, but white, blacked up, but under all the paint, still white faces you could depend on to look not all alike, but like your own, pale, individuated, human. All white performers stressed the broadsheet notice for the High Henry Minstrels when they played Sacandaga in 1903, and this poster for Primrose and West's troupe you see here um, suggests that. The description put local readers on notice, except no substitutes, it said. Whatever these colored outfits claim they do, we do better. Stay true to your race, this thing belongs to us. That us tightened up as the 20th century progressed. It still meant white, but when small town Adirondackers began putting on their own shows and giving the bigger city shows a run for the money, blackface also came to stand for home. Most of the Lake Placid news about a 1915 Elks benefit at the crowded happy hour theater, capacity 400, and it was full, the kings of minstrelsy have nothing on our local talent. The local blackface playbook was not much different from the cities among the tunes that went over big in Lake Placid, Jungle Town, and Laugh You Little. But seeing neighbors playing rascals, strumpets, clowns, seeing neighbors do it, this was novel and it drew. And some homegrown reviews got so good at what they did, they took it on the road. The Saranac Valley Grange Minstrels to Beekman Town, Jay's Whiteface, Grange Minstrels to Keene, Wallensburg, and Peru, the Wilmington Grange Minstrels to Reber and Osable Forks. Black minstrel shows raised cash for black institutions and philanthropies 
white productions poured earnings into community improvements. In 1896, the homegrown ladies' fi refined minstrels raked in big money for an ambulance for the hospital in Gloversville. For the next half century, Adirondack Rotarians, Kiwanis, Masons, Elks, Lions, Knights of Columbus, Odd Fellows, Veterans Groups, and many Granges all put Blackface Minstrelsy to work for civic fundraising and betterment. Blackface benefits fundraised for hot lunches in Vermontville. Um, in Tupper Lake for the Boy Scouts and the Fire Department, in Long Lake for the Calvary Women's Society, in um, Elizabethtown, um, where this benefit occurred, I don't know what the point of the benefit was, who the beneficiary would be, but benefit it was nonetheless. Um, in Plattsburgh, a, um, a Blackface Review raised money for a high school trip to New York City. A minstrel show visited the Clinton and Dannemora prisons to raise funds for an inmate's recreation center. Local productions bolstered white non-sectarian community identity and pride, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew. Some of these descended of immigrants who had themselves been racialized and othered on their arrival, gladly blacked up for a show. Children put on minstrel shows, parents and teachers aided up. At the Playhouse in Ticonderoga, 1928, eight schoolgirls blacked up as the Pickaninnies. In 1929, students at Malone's Franklin Academy put on In the Garden of the Shah, the stock blackface character Samuel Johnson Jackson, servant, was, quote, as laughable as a colored boy in all sorts of predicaments in Persia should be. In Clintonville, sixth graders produced the crazy for their fall play. That was in 1954 for Halloween. The stage alone could not contain this craze. It was too liquid and too loved. It leaked into parades, dances, classrooms, hospitals, winter carnivals like this one, the Lake Placid Skating Rink, a CCC Camp Rec Hall. In Plattsburgh, 1903, a syncopated black face cakewalk on horseback electrified a horse show. In 1926, patients in the state hospital in Tupper Lake were entertained by a local women's troupe in blackface playing, quote, bellhops and southern mammies in true cotton field colors. For Dominion Days in Malone, 1935, a huge parade fed an American Canadian goodwill with a float from the Dark Town Fire Department, a blackface crew of firemen. In World War II, Tupper Lakes Junior High sponsored a base basketball game to raise funds for soldiers posted overseas. One team wore clown suits, the other black paint. Other iterations of blackface style once removed, which found their way into Adirondack homes, kitchens, nurseries, classrooms, stores, wind-up toys, knickknacks, cookie jars, salt and pepper shakers, nursery rhymes, a suit for sale in Brown at Wiley's Clothing Store in Glens Falls. In 1941, Adirondack grade schools offered the kids play the toys that had to feature a doll. White children blacked up for this role in Speculator, Saranac Lake in Ellenburg. At the annual Christmas party for the orphans in the Clinton County Children's Home in 1931, children could pick and choose among, quote, tiny baby dolls and cribs, mama dolls, and even dolls. In St. Regis Falls in 1930, home decorating tips in the newspaper that urged boy, boys' bedroom upholstery and pants feature colonial scenes of gaily bandanaed mammies picking cotton in the fields of the South. And all this when in the real South, the living South, the state-sanctioned culture of peonage subjected black men and boys by the tens of thousands to slavery by another name, on farms and pine plantations and in lumber yards, quarries, cotton mills, chain gangs, and the mines of U.S. steel, which, Adiranga, which Adirondackers well knew in their newspapers were all the syndicated reports of lynchings and other evidence of racism and lawlessness down there. But white supremacism at home, this was hidden in plain sight. In 2004, the ethnomusicologist Susan Hurley Glaua interviewed several older folks in Colton in St. Lawrence County. Blackface, a long tradition in this hamlet, 
was revived in 1954, and it continued 15 years. Many locals with whom she spoke had loved these shows. Some had been performers. All counted them as nothing but good fun, nothing racist about it. And anyway, how could it be, and how could they be when none of them knew any black people? We know the reach of a prejudicial bias has no need of personal exposure or experience. When Hitler came to power, the Jewish population in Germany was less than 1%. Yet anti-Semitism was a core rationale for Nazi ideology. In the United States, a derogatory idea of blackness claimed a territory much greater than black people lived. From the first days of the slave trade and the Supreme Court ruling in 1857 that declared all black Americans, free or enslaved, beings of an inferior order, to humor columns in Adirondack newspapers that traded in race jokes and the weekly badinage of the Amos and Andy, Amos and Andy radio hour, little Colton, no less than all the Adirondack region, had been carpet bombed with white ideas about blackness. And what black Blackface blackness meant inside the blue line was what it meant across the land. It stood for lessness. It meant less brains, poor character, perpetual hilarity, no demonstrable capacity for citizenship or responsibility, no value but cheerful service. It meant everything you really didn't want for yourself. What distinguished Adirondack blackface from the urban versions wasn't the content or racial subtext of the shows, but how it came to be identified with public service and community building, which may seem like a compensatory grace. Who would deny a hospital and ambulance or hot lunches for a school? But the landscape here gets a little darker and more complex when we discover the debt these good works owed to a ritualized assertion of white supremacism and black lessness so cheerfully embedded in convention, it could seem almost incidental, just another thing we do, we've always done, no harm meant, and no harm done. No harm meant, I, I, I buy mostly, who can argue with intention, but no harm done. Here's where we pause. Surely, harm was done to Adirondack children encouraged every year to embrace a fable of black servility and incapacity or to any Adirondacker whose only view or idea of black people came from images that, however merrily, however dotingly, derided. And when white people imposed those ideas on black people, met them with an assumption of their backwardness, servility, black people registered the blow as well. It was the very expectation of this kind of encounter that helps explain why this region has been historically a hard sell for black tourists and prospective residents. An idea of blackness entrenched this deep dies hard. Where does this all leave us now? It's an awkward moment viewing all these mostly happy faces and then feeling called to judge. Is this our place, our obligation? I'm not interested in legislating your response, but at the least we can try, I think, to hold in mind our recognition of what blackface meant to black Americans especially. Hold it in mind when we look at pictures like these and we think blandly, well, they're just having a good time. Blackface did make white people laugh, but laugh at whose expense? For better, better than a century, local efforts to help bolster community growth and small town pride in the Adirondack region was annealed to a racialized idea of black backwardness, black servility, and this had consequences, elusive, hard to quantify, but no less meaningful for that. Why, blackface, why Adirondack blackface fell from grace is no mystery. Between the lessons of the civil rights movement, a growing interest <clears throat> in racial justice, and the rising threat, litigation, blackface simply ran out of excuses. It had nowhere to go but down. Not that it's wholly disappeared, it still stirs and mumbles, jerks to life for the odd caper, as we know. Any strong taboo will provoke occasional defiance, especially among the young, and especially when all they know about blackface is they aren't supposed to do it. They don't know the history. They don't know what it stood for. How would they, how would any of us, when that history isn't taught? 
Local and regional historians never wrote about it. No Adirondack Museum has plumbed the popularity of minstrelsy in the region or pondered, pondered its tenacity. No high school history curriculum has tackled it. Until we face it as a meaningful part of Adirondack history, we can't disavow it or move on. Blackness has no big role in the Adirondack story, we assure ourselves, when so few Blacks were here. But the Black American experience had, has been shape ruled and largely devastated by white ideas about blackness and black, blackface is one of those ideas. Thank you. Well, well very good. Thanks, Cliff. Um, yeah, that's um, very powerful. I, I'm almost at a loss for words. Um, Insulting, fascinating, um, and strangely entertaining. Um, ooh. Um, I have to ask, what, 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 I guess, what drove you into this subject? Um, the story that this folklorist wrote a long time ago, 16 years ago, for Voices magazine, um, for the New York Folklore Society, focused just on this little town where her grandparents lived and they participated in a blackface show. And she approached it as a folklorist and, and she didn't judge, she didn't delve into it in that way. And she, she did, and I was, provoked to do that and to see if that story applied to the broader region, if it was a regional story or if Colton was something exceptional and exceptionally weird, because I hadn't heard of blackface anywhere in the region until I read her article. And that really provoked me because, and I, I like a challenge. So I thought, well, I'm going to just check this out county by county and do a word search and see what comes up when I put in blackface, minstrels, and all the code words that go with. And I was astonished. I have folders on every county in the Adirondacks that are an inch thick, a half inch thick of notices in the papers that I didn't run in this um, PowerPoint flagging these shows. I was amazed at the breadth and the depth of it. And that I thought was an amazing story. This was an Adirondack cultural phenomenon, no less than the service, no less than the traveling peddler. Just one of those, things people took entirely for granted for a good long while. That, that got me going. Was blackface a term used at the time of these minstrel shows or yeah. did the term come later? Yeah, no, the term, um, you know, I don't know the exact an answer to that, but I think blackface is used as early as the 1850s. I don't think it's a later term. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a derogatory term. It's considered the name for the art form, for the performance style. And, and I was going to ask, were there, were there minstrel shows without blackface? You bet. There were white minstrel shows, um, and there were black minstrel shows that had no derogatory content or, or dramatic content. They were singing. There were performance shows of singing. Um, and they were bringing the old South to the North. So they are a, a, a mixed bag too, in a way. But I, that didn't interest me so much as the white image of blackness through these shows coming to the region. I don't really think you can talk about black history in the region without considering the white understanding of black people. I don't think you can separate those subjects. So this fascinated me for that reason too, because I've done a lot on black history, but nothing on this. This was a whole new ball of wax, ball of grease um, paint. Yeah. Do you consider the Confederate flag as the new nostalgia ritual in the Adirondacks? Is this a common thing among rural communities across America? Well, I'm sheltering in Vermont now and I see two of them at the end of my street. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I think it's, I see a lot of them in the hinterlands in New England. I can't speak for the rest of the country, but. Um, you know, going back to the minstrel shows, um, 
were performances in public schools typical? And was it common for participants to be as young as 10? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I don't think that was exceptional at all. I don't think it was considered outrageous, strange. It was a conventional art form. It was a script you got in the mail. Um, the government supplied some of these scripts during the depression to schools and communities. This was a, a national thing. The Adirondacks is not exceptional in any way except maybe in how long it lasted in this region. And I think that might be a function of yield it was to a town's sense of identity and pride, that this was a tradition that helped a town brand itself and, and love itself. And it was cherished um, from one community to the next. And it was competitive. Who has the best minstrel show? Is it Faust? Is it Afreda? Is it Tupper Lake? Which had a lot of them um, and raised an awful lot of money for a lot of worthy causes at the expense of the invisible othered black American. It was um, mocking. Do you know of any record of African Americans expressing concern about the black minstrel shows in the Adirondacks? In the Adirondacks, no, but Frederick Douglass didn't like them one bit. He um, thought they were a menace and um, a disgrace, and he spoke out against them. I did a little homework yesterday on other black voices against, and white against minstrelsy. I didn't have much success, but I don't think I looked very hard, and I think I could find a lot more if I searched harder on that. In the Adirondacks, uh, anti-blackface voices come from the church, and their concern is with um, its body, secular, vulgar quality, especially in the beginning, uh, before it was appropriated by town institutions and made sort of semi-respectable. In the very beginning, when it was riding into town with the circus, it was a much raunchier affair. That's my sense. And maybe the ones that continued to come to the towns around the region that were bigger, to entertainment areas on fair days and so forth, kept up some of that sexualized con content that really upset uh, the ministry. Well, what is the last dated photograph you have from, from the Adirondacks? Mine, I think, is in the 50s, but I know that the um, Colton blackface minstrelsy continues into the 60s. I didn't see a photograph from that era, but that is described in the article I've cited. So there are pictures somewhere that show it happening that late. And I welcome anybody's contributions who has images or news of late stage minstrelsy in the Adirondacks. I'd love to know more about it. Mm. Yeah. Well, this was very, very eye-opening. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it feeds well into the complexity of uh, white America's relationship with black America. Uh, you know, you look at a minstrel as being so harmless and, and demeaning. And then, you know, we black Americans also carry the burden of being the big menace, the, the black menace, you know, the scary, the boogeyman. And yet, um, uh, do, you, do you think at all that minstrels came to tame that boogeyman um, reputation? or that's a, really, that's a very interesting thought. I mean, certainly they're... I don't know the word for this. They're made. They're they're made to be juvenile. They're made into submen. The minstrel man is not a fully evolved, mature guy. He's childish. He's childlike. He's he's um, his role is to be directed. He gets asked the questions. He doesn't ask the questions. He he he's in a subordinate role, and that is a maybe a soothing and gratifying um, figuration for people in towns who hadn't met black people, didn't know them, only had wild images in their head and are looking to domesticate whatever fantasies are 
I don't know. I don't know, Cliff. <laughs> the whole thing is <laughs> is extremely mysterious to me, and I don't I don't know how to unpack it all. What are you going to do with that cookie jar of yours? That's what I want to know. Well, we use it as a cookie jar. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I say I inherited from an aunt who uh, who swore it had um, uh, financial value. Um, having attended a uh, a black memorabilia show myself, I know the expense some of these things can bring. Um, yeah, and it's. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, as a collector's value, it has huge collector's value, I'm sure. But it's it's yeah. weird, it's weird <laughs> to have it. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's very strange to have it because it is demeaning. Yeah. But at the same time, it's history. Yeah. I mean, it's it's history, and it's a it's a great insight into one of the ways that we are thought of. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's totally, um, it's totally weird. <laughs> um, so do you think there's been any progress made? Oh, sure. No, no, I know this progress has been made, but I mean, in the awareness of what minst of what minstrels played, of the role that minstrels played in, um, in the, in the view of blacks. I don't know that there's progress. There's, there's a sort of great unawareness. I don't think people are aware of this history. And before we can kind of reckon with it and figure out what it means and how it plays into our understanding of Adirondack social culture, we have to know it was there. Now, I just tapped a handful of historical societies, museums, and all but one of them came up with images within a day. That's amazing. Imagine how many more might emerge if we went to every historical society and small museum in the Adirondack region and say, mm -hmm. what have you got? Or private collectors or other repositories of this. I think it would be quite a collection. Just in a few days of looking, I found these marvelously informative images. And um, I think there's probably quite a lot more out there. Once you know the scope of the thing, you can kind of begin to calculate its influence and think about it in, in terms of Adirondack culture and then think about why it was that people did not take offense or protest. I don't think it's quite as simple as saying every Adirondacker is a racist. I don't think that's the way to look at it or explain it. I think there was such an extraordinary dissociation between how people thought about the masked figures on the on the stage their own people their own neighbors and what those masks represented and what they stood for in the national picture it's shocking to me that's the shock that the dissociation was so widespread so pervasive that you could look at something so offensive and not grasp it's offensiveness. I don't quite know how to explain that. I'd love to hear from people who are listening on how this comes to be and how to safeguard against it. How do we keep ourselves from doing the same thing, looking at an outrage in plain sight and not recognizing it for what it is, only in retrospect, only looking back, which has obviously happened or we'd still be doing blackface shows and we're not. There's Thank no you. thought of it. It's, <laughs> yep. it's appalling. I mean, one blackface incident brings down an enormous heap of opprobrium on the college kids who do it, and they have no clue what they're doing. They don't even know why it's so appalling, I don't think. They don't know this history and what this stuff stands for. And I think that's, that's it. They don't know this history. Yeah. Um, yeah, a little knowledge goes a long way. It does. And I don't see it being disseminated, but maybe this is a start and it can, it can begin. Yeah. Well, it's time to draw things to a close. I would like to thank Amy Godine for this incredible detective work in developing the information and images for this evening's presentation. I would also like to thank all of the members of our audience for watching and listening in. Additional programs in this series, The Black Experience in the Adirondacks, 
will be scheduled in September. Please watch for announcements on the Adirondack Experience and Adirondack Diversity Initiative website. Thank you. Thank you. And good Thanks night. to everyone. Thank you.